There's a lot of different myths out there about what tractive effort is, how it's calculated, and what affects it, especially in the steam railroading world. Does sand affect it? What about adding more drivers or additional weight? Well, today we're going to answer these questions and bust these myths in a little bit of Railroad 101 Mythbusters edition. What's up guys, this is Heiss, and that's right, we're talking all things tractive effort. Let's just jump right into it. So what is tractive effort anyways? Well, I did a fun video kind of comparing tractive effort and horsepower more than a year ago, times fake, but the idea is it's really how much a locomotive can truly pull. If you were to put a force gauge on that rear coupler as it's working as hard as it can, you'd basically get that tractive effort rating. So tractive effort is measured as a force. Pounds for us in the US, Newtons for most other folks, and that forces how much it can pull, but not directly in terms of weight. You gotta remember that, yes, a train car might weigh 100 tons, but that doesn't mean it takes 100 tons of force to pull it. It's all based on the resistance in the bearings of the car itself, the degree of curvature, how tight the curves are biting those flanges, and then any additional grade that the locomotive is trying to pull up. And that's what determines how much an engine can pull based on its tractive effort. Now bear with me here, a lot of these myths are going to become really obvious and easy to understand when you understand the equation. So we're going to get into a little math nerdiness. If you want to skip past that, remember that everything is time stamped down below. You can pick whichever chapter you want to jump to. Tractive effort for a very typical two-cylinder, simple locomotive, no compounding, your bread and butter, most steam locomotives fall underneath this equation, is usually calculated as 0.85 times the boiler pressure, maximum allowable working pressure, assuming your fireman's good, times the diameter of the pistons, squared, times the stroke of the piston, all divided by the driver diameter. So if you know how big your pistons are, how far they move, how big your wheels are, what pressure the locomotive operates at, you can answer everything you need about the tractive effort. And if that seems like too much math, there's actually a really handy calculator where you can just put all those things in on steamlocomotive.com, shout out and go check that out, links in the description. And so our first myth has to do with that 0.85 factor. A lot of folks say that that is the maximum cutoff, which is the point at which steam stops getting added to the cylinder. So for the whole stroke of that piston, at a certain point, the steam supply will stop and that's known as the point of cutoff. A lot of times it is around 85% of the stroke, so 0.85. And then the last 15% is all expansion. But that's not what that value actually is in the equation. A lot of folks assume that is the cutoff because, oh, okay, well, you're not getting full force on the piston for the whole time of that stroke, so we gotta multiply by that cutoff point to reduce things. But in actuality, that, that 0.85 is made of three different things. And as such, it's actually not always 0.85, that's just the most typical value. What it is, is actually three different constants pushed into one. The first is pi divided by four, which is a factor to actually make a circular area, if you're talking about multiplying a diameter rather than a radius. And that's how you get the circle part of the piston that seems to be missing from the equation. The second constant is the ratio of the mean tractive force to the minimum tractive force. And we use this because depending on the angle of the main rod, which is what the piston connects to, Depending on that angle, it may not be applying force on one side, or it might be applying not a total force, so we need to be able to smooth that out and get a constant thing that is going to give us the overall power through one circuit of the wheels. And then the last constant of these set of threes is in fact the cutoff. So given those three factors with pi over four, a common value of 1.2 for most locomotives in terms of that second piece, and then for a lot of locomotives, cutoffs actually closer to 90%, not necessarily 85%, that's what gives you the common factor of about 0.85 for the multiplication there. And I know that was just a ton of math, 
And a lot of those things aren't really gonna change unless you've got special or odd or modified locomotives, stares at the Pennsylvania Railroad. But remember, you can always go play with the calculator on steamlocomotive.com and learn all those things. Myth number two, sand adds more tractive effort. The tractive effort rating does not change. It's based on that equation that we just defined in the last section, and you'll note there was no portion of that equation that said sand. What sand can help provide is additional traction during less than optimal friction conditions. Locomotives have what is called a factor of adhesion, which is the ratio of the weight on the drive wheels to the actual tractive effort of the locomotive, that tractive effort rating that doesn't change. The coefficient of friction between a steel wheel and a steel rail is around 0.25 when we're talking about rolling friction, which means that you basically want the ratio of weight to tractive effort to be about the same as that so that it actually works out. And when you're talking about an inverted equation, that comes out to a number four, right? One quarter, four over one, etc. So you wanna have four times the weight on the drivers than the tractive effort is if you want to be able to reliably use the friction you have. So if you have less than that, it's more likely that you're gonna break free and slip the drivers. And if you have more than that, then your locomotive's kind of too heavy and not as powerful as it should be. Sand can increase that 0.25 number, that coefficient of friction, to a much higher number, which allows for a smaller chance of wheel slip, but it's not gonna change the total tractive effort. You're only ever going to be able to put out what that maximum rating is from the locomotive. This is particularly helpful when you've got slipperier conditions like rain or snow, things like that, that reduce the coefficient of friction and make it harder for you to meet your actual tractive effort. It doesn't mean you get any extra force above what the locomotive is already capable of. Myth number three, more drive wheels and kind of conversely with that, more weight adds more tractive effort. And again, you'll note in that equation that we talked about, there was no term that related to the number of drive wheels or the weight of the locomotive even. However, these do factor in to the factor of adhesion and the weight on drivers we just talked about in the last section. You can keep piling on weight to increase the factor of adhesion, but at the end of the day, the civil engineering of the railroad means that you can only make a locomotive so heavy with a certain amount of wheels before the axle loading's too heavy and you're just beating the crap out of the railroad. So you need to balance the number of drivers relative to the weight of the locomotive. So for certain sizes and power scales, you might need more drivers to achieve it, but it doesn't directly change that tractive effort rating. So typically you'll see locomotives with high tractive effort ratings have more drivers, but it's not related directly to the tractive effort. Technically, by the science of it, you could have a very, 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 very heavy locomotive with only one driver set, and it could use that tractive effort. Uh, it's just that the MOW guys would probably kill you for it. Myth number four, bigger drivers add more tractive effort. This is one that comes up from particularly non-railroad people. Mechanical engineers think, okay, bigger torque arm, more torque, more power. You love that. When I get a bigger wrench, I've got more power. If I get a bigger drive wheel, relative to the locomotive and the rail, we're increasing that. That should mean I've got more force behind me, right? Well, no. And again, I'm beating the dead horse with the equation here, but reminder that the driver diameter is in the denominator. It's on the bottom. So if that number gets big, tractive effort goes small. Or if the driver diameter gets small, tractive effort gets big. And that's because it's all about a leverage ratio. And what's actually applying the torque to the wheels is the stroke of the piston. So if you have a bigger piston stroke, yeah, okay, it's like getting a bigger wrench. It's not relative to the wheels because you've got a backwards lever essentially where bigger wheel diameter just means that you're adding more resistance and you're lessening your own leverage against the wheel from your pistons. Myth number five, locomotives can achieve their maximum tractive effort rating at many different speeds. The equation for the steam locomotive tractive effort is for what we call starting tractive effort. The amount of force that can be applied from a dead standstill. When the locomotive's not moving but the throttle's wide open, 
That's how much force you can get. Diesel locomotives have a tractive effort curve, and that probably merits its own video. This is gonna go long enough and nerdy enough as it is. But for steam locomotives, it's all about how much steam the boiler can generate. If the locomotive can generate enough steam to keep full cutoff at speed, it will keep things moving at that tractive effort rating. But loss of pressure or reduced cutoff is going to change the maximum tractive effort that the locomotive can produce at that speed. Per the equation, it modulates those factors. This is why a lot of different railroads actually apply to factor to their tonnage ratings to ensure that locomotives could actually run at higher speeds, but still pull close to the maximum weight that they can. Because if you're pulling the absolute maximum, you're not really gonna get going that quick. You actually need to keep the cutoff pretty far forward to keep that going, and that's really mechanically bad and hurtful for the locomotives. You're putting a lot more stress on the components, and you're gonna have a lot more failures on the road than if you could run the trains a little bit lighter. And so historically, the railroads added a little factor and made sure they weren't beating the snot out of their locomotives. Myth number six. There's nothing that you can do to change that tractive effort rating, right? Well, I just gave you five compelling reasons of all these things and other things about the equation that don't change it or impact it, and that's the maximum that you get. And there's a few, some select locomotives that actually cheat around this. And that's with the use of a booster engine. Some locomotives have a secondary small steam engine applied maybe on the tender truck or the trailing truck of the locomotive that doesn't really work at high speeds because the way that it's geared down and all that, but can add a boost of tractive force and tractive effort early on at slower speeds, giving you a higher starting tractive effort so that you could run closer to tonnage and then not need that full cutoff we were talking about. Locomotives like the Reading 2102 and the Southern Pacific 4449 are the example of a few locomotives that run to this day that have these boosters. They're really neat pieces of engineering and a neat way to kind of give the little oomph at the start. Steam locomotives are notorious for not being able to start a train that they can easily pull at speed. So uh, the booster helps you overcome that fact. Anyways, guys, I hope you learned something new from this. Maybe you learned something about tractive effort or had one of your own myths busted. But hopefully it was helpful and hopefully you found it interesting. And as always, if I missed anything, let me know down in the comments below if there's any other topics like you want to talk about diesel tractive effort or anything else like that. Let me know and uh, we'll see what we can cover. Anyways, guys, thank you so much for watching. We will catch you all next time.